tonight we're here to talk about Labradors. And you know what, guys? We already did two of those webinars today. We had great discussions with some of your, uh, uh, some of the other Labradors breeders who joined us. And before we start, before we get into or we dive into the content, I have one question for you. One very simple question. When you think of Labradors, of this breed you like so much, what do you immediately think of? Tell me on the chat, what are Labradors known for? Tell us on the chat, what, the, what is the first thing that comes to mind when you think of your favorite breed? And again, don't be shy because, you know, we are all Labrador lovers here. And the cool thing is we will be able to compare your answers with the ones we got from the two previous webinars, which is super fun when we do the 9 p.m. So tell us on the chat, what do you think of when you think of Labradors? What's the first, first thing that comes to mind? <laughs> I'm seeing the answer appearing. <laughs> I like yours, Dr. Kessler. <laughs> So five, four, three, two, one. Okay. And you know what, guys? The way you answered is very similar to what your, the other, uh, the other uh, Labrador breeders answered this afternoon and uh, earlier this evening. You guys mentioned the hunting, the retrieving, the great temperament, and also the fact that those dogs, and Rose, Rose mentioned it as well, have a voracious appetite. So, as you know, I'm sure our Labradors will deny this, but this, this is a fact. This breed is known for its ability to basically swallow everything in a heartbeat. Strong appetite, prone to obesity. You know, the genetic background behind this has even been described recently in the scientific literature. If you've heard about the canine Ponzi gene, well, this one is in Labrador retrievers associated with increased appetite and risk of obesity. So there's a genetic background behind it. So you see, that's why we have diets formulated for Labradors that have a lower energy density. That is why the shape of the kibbles used in Labrador diets is meant to decrease the speed of ingestion. And that's what Labradors are really know, known for indeed. And today, tonight, we're going to talk about Reproduction in Labradors. You see, the topic, as you know, is very, very dear to my heart, but one might wonder, and to tell you the truth, in fact, some of you told me up front while I was preparing the content, hey, Doc, why should I attend? I already know everything here, I believe. So, you see, this slide here, it contains words, big words, some of those big words we will find only in canine reproduction textbooks. Those are conditions, disorders, that we will encounter on a daily basis when we work in a reprovet clinic, basically. And if we were to look at those from, let's say, a Labrador retriever perspective, so to speak, what do you think would happen? Are Labradors known to be predisposed to any of those? Do you know, to be fair, not really. Labradors are not known to be predisposed to very specific reproductive disorders. And usually, when I was working in the vet clinic, it was even quite the opposite. When it comes to canine reproduction, <laughs> Labradors are often described as an easy breed. However, let me remind you guys of the philosophy behind our webinar. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. As Dr. Kessler told me earlier, I should say a, a gram of prevention is worth a kilogram of cure. Sure. Labradors are not that difficult when it comes to breeding. That's a fact. No doubt about that. That's the general situation. However, there are definitely, there can definitely be some reproductive challenges. If you breed labs, I can tell you that one day or another, you will face them. That's the reality when we breed dogs. And that's why today, that's why tonight, we will discuss three of them. We'll talk about Buttercup. We'll talk about Ziggy. And we'll also talk about Lily. Well, obviously, I got some help renaming those bitches because those are not the original names. But, uh, but keep in mind, however, that those are three clinical cases we did encounter 
during our careers. Those were Labradors. And still, those were Labradors that were seen as three reproductive challenges. And those challenges, who knows, maybe one day you'll have to deal with them. So in order to help you guys being prepared when it comes to that, you know what? Now let's dive into those clinical cases and see what we can learn from those Labrador reproductive challenges. So from now on, I'm going to leave the virtual floor to Dr. Kessler. We'll, chat, we, we'll switch to the English part of the presentation. So, Doc, the virtual floor is yours. I leave them in Thank you, Dr. Fontaine. Appreciate it. Um, so I get to start out with uh, the first clinical case, and uh, it's kind of exciting for me. Um, because this clinical case that uh, we're going to go through first sort of uh, uh, reminds me of the first lab that ever walked through my uh, practice many, many, many years ago um, for a reproductive problem. Uh, and, and back then, um, with a similar uh, problem, we didn't have the uh, technology that we have today. So um, it's kind of nice to go through this clinical case and talk about uh, buttercup. So this is the story of Buttercup, and obviously, um, see the lab, and uh, a beautiful lab. So Buttercup just turned three years old, and her owner really thinks she has lots of potential in the breeding world. She's in um, great health. That's one thing that's nice. Um, we know that from uh, basically uh, tests that we've run, and uh, we also know that from her energy levels. So that's a good thing. She also has a great temperament, as many labs uh, do, so that's why we're here talking about labs today, because most of them have great temperaments. And on top of that, she has great genetics. So her owner, owner definitely thinks she would be a great addition to her breeding program. There is one thing, tiny problem, though, and as far as her owner can tell, she has basically never been in season. And that's kind of a bummer, especially if we're going to use her in a, a repro. So no season at all obviously means no breeding. So in our veterinary jargon, this is what we call primary anestrus. And there's lots of reasons that uh, primary anestrus occurs. And so basically, we're going to start off with a poll question for you all. So what could cause this, that she has not come into heat by the time she's three years of age? Could it be stress? Is it because she's overweight? Is it because of genetics? Or is it a general disorder? So please take a few minutes and participate. We're looking forward to your answers. All right. We're getting a little bit of everything here. And that's good. So let's get to the results. So they're pretty much even. We get stress of them 33 and genetics 33. So to be fair, all those could potentially play a role in Buttercup's condition here. So that's good. The answers are, are right where we want them to be. Um, however, because this is Labradors and we were talking about here, there is one that we absolutely need to emphasize. And you guessed it, it's being overweight. And when we talk about being overweight, we mean excess fat. And one thing you need to remember about that, it is not only about energy storage, it is about hormones. So fat is also an endocrine tissue. This means it produces hormones, sex hormones in particular. So these include estrogens, progesterone, testosterone, and those hormones are part of the dialogue between fat and what we call HPA. HPA stands for hypothalamus pituitary axis. So basically, that big word means that's the command center of the reproductive function inside our dog's brains. So when a dog is in adequate body condition, there that's not a big deal. However, in overweight dogs, excessive amounts of these hormones are secreted. And the reproductive function is all about balance. And this type of condition throws the balance way off. So therefore, in Labrador suffering from fertility issues, there is always something we want to assess and correct if, and correct if needed. So body condition score. That just means a very simple thing. We only want to breed labs 
bitches in optimal body condition score. And that's what BCS there stands for. So when you breathe Abidors, this is your top priority. Make sure they're in proper body condition score. There are tools available that can help you out, and you can discuss this with your veterinarian. However, this is really an important takeaway because remember what we all mentioned at the beginning. Optimal body condition score in breeding Labradors must be your top priority. So I mentioned earlier that Buttercup is in optimal body condition score, so we can pretty much rule that out as a cause of primary anestrus. She is a valuable breeding subject, and her owner really wants to breed her and investigate the problem why she's not coming into heat. So we have another poll question for you. What do you think she should look into here? Should we check her thyroid? Should we check her progesterone? How about performing genital ultrasounds or performing a vaginal smear? So give us your answers and we'll go from there. Okay, everybody jump in here. We want to hear everybody's results. All right, we'll give you a few more seconds and then we'll go to the results. All right, the results. So this is pretty much similar to the other webinars we had. Um, check your thyroid has basically been the uh, number one answer that we've received. So in a case like uh, we're seeing here, there is just one thing that Dr. Fontaine and I would uh, not see any point in doing. Um, and I think we hope by the time this is over with today that you would agree with us, is that this is called the thyroid thing. So we would not be checking her thyroid. I mention it because, well, hypothyroidism, which means low thyroid levels, is something that we often see on top of differential diagnosis list in reproductive cases. Today, however, we have clear evidence that if a bitch suffers from thyroid problems, the first reason for consultation would certainly not be infertility. You will see skin problems. We see dogs being overweight. We see dogs having low activity levels, but certainly not infertility and or primary anestrus. So that's something that we want you to understand and take away from this. There is a whole body of literature confirming this. All the other tests I mentioned in the question will be helpful because they will give us a clear idea of the status of the bitch's reproductive function. So let's go on and decide about primary anestrus. We need to rule out what are the most common causes of primary anestrus. So, silent heat, what about them? You guys also call them ghost heat. The bitch gets in season, but the owner does not notice it because there are no clinical signs associated with it. She is not losing blood. She's not swelling. Males are not interested. So keep this in mind, though. Some people, um, some breeders often tell me that silent heats will be detected by the males. Truth is, um, that is rarely the case. It could therefore be a cause of primary anestrus. Something else that we need to take into account are vaginal defects. If there is a genital malformation at the level of the vagina, Again, the bitch might not exhibit any clinical signs when she is in season. No bleeding, no swelling. So an interesting fact, if you type in reproduction plus Labradors on PubMed, which is basically the search engine for scientific papers, you will find several clinical cases of labs presenting with vaginal defects. So it's definitely something that you and your veterinarian want to check on a case like Buttercup. So what else are we thinking about? How about ovarian disease? Ovarian disease could be a defect, such as ovarian cysts, ovarian tumors. Any of those defects could prevent the bitch from exhibiting her season. And we need basically to investigate that. And then the last one that we want to talk about is stress. So I know we always blame stress for everything these days, but when it comes to reproduction, there are very good reasons for doing so. Stress leads to production of cortisol, and high levels of cortisol in the body will definitely inhibit ovarian activity. So if the bitch is super stressed, 
she might never exhibit clinical signs that she is an estrus. So Buttercup owners wanted to find out what was going on. So that's why she consulted with me. So in Buttercup's case, I would definitely rule out stress. When we saw her in the clinic, she was our typical friendly Labrador. Did not seem stressed at all. So we went for a typical approach on a case like that. So let's start ruling out. So Dr. Fontaine here wrote vaginal toucher or touche. Don't know how to pronounce that in French, but basically in the United States, we would call that a vaginal exam. Um, and we confirmed that there were no vaginal abnormalities. So then the next thing that we wanted to do was perform a vaginal smear. The computer basically agrees with us. So doing a vaginal smear basically um, determines what stage of the cycle she's in. And so when we did it, it looked like this. So those cells tell us basically she's in an estrus. Not much happening there. We know she's not in heat from a vaginal smear. So then basically what do we do next? We wanted to move on from there. So when we're looking at and deciding, we wanted to do a progesterone. So the progesterone gave us a result of basal, which is basically baseline, which means um, she shows no sign of ovulating. She showed no signs of being in heat. So again, we're back into uh, why is she in an estrus and why is she showing no signs of heat. So what do we do next? We want to do an ultrasound. Um, we want to make sure there's no abnormalities that we can detect by ultrasound. And when we did it, the ultrasound showed us basically this. And when we look at this ultrasound, we see basically a normal-looking um, ovary. So we basically have a normal vaginal uh, exam. We have a normal vaginal smear that tells us she's an anesthetist. Um, we have a progesterone level that basically is baseline, and we have a vaginal, I mean, a, a ultrasound that doesn't tell us much in the way of, except that she's normal. So what do you think? Is she sterile? Does she do a silent heat? Does she have an ovarian cyst that we didn't find on ultrasound? Or is there nothing wrong with her? So take a minute, give us your answer, your thoughts. All right, a few more seconds and we'll jump to the results. So we have answers uh, for each and every one of them. Um, so the fact here is there was nothing really abnormal that we, we detected, which is good. It doesn't tell us exactly why, but basically it tells us um, that we didn't detect anything so the vaginal smear, again, was typical of anesthetics, sexual rest. There was no hormonal impregnation of progesterone, so it was baseline. Ovaries looked okay to us on ultrasound. Didn't see any cyst, really nothing abnormal. So based on what we just saw, she is apparently in anesthetics, this phase of the cycle when there is just no hormone impregnation. So the owner has never seen her in season. So according to you, what would be the next step? Another poll question. So do we just wait and see and see if she comes into heat? Do we do vaginal smears every two weeks and see if um, we can detect when she's coming into heat? How about doing ovarian ultrasounds every two weeks um, and then see if we can detect that? Or do we try to induce her in season? Those are all different ways to approach it. So let's see what you would do. Give you a few more seconds here and we'll go to the results. So we have a few to wait and see. We have a few to do vaginal smears every two weeks. And then we have a couple that would induce her in season. So we basically could do the wait and see. We basically could do vaginal smears. Um, but we thought basically the uh, good option, since we didn't find anything abnormal on her, 
was to induce her in season. And that's exactly what we talked about doing. So, again, there is no hormonal impregnation, no ovarian defects or cysts. So once we check that as normal, estrus induction can definitely be in, in attempted. Okay? There's lots of protocols out there for inducing estrus in, in bitches. Um, so let's talk a little bit about each and every one. Way back when, when I started practicing uh, reproduction, this is what we used. We used gonadotropin. Um, and gonadotropins uh, gave us results that were eh, sometimes good, sometimes bad. Um, so in the past, we used them. And these basically are equivalent of a pituitary hormones, and they will help stimulate or are supposed to help stimulate the ovarian activity. This is what we still use in large animals as well as in pigs. However, in canines, we just didn't get the results that uh, we wanted to. So estrus induction was anywhere from 0 to 60%. Ovulation rates were about 40 to 60%. And pregnancy rates were zero to 50. So not the greatest results that we're looking for if we're inducing estrus in, uh, in, in females today. So let's rule out the use of gonadotropins, and that's pretty much what I've done in my practice. Um, so what do we do next? So now there are two preferred options. One is called dopamine agonist, and this is something that we use a fair amount. And when we talk about that, estrus induction, about 80%. That's pretty good. Ovulation, 100%. That's great. And pregnancy rates up around 80%. So nothing to argue with there. We're just getting some good results from dopamine agonists. And then the next one that we might want to talk about um, is basically uh, GNRH A implants, okay? And if you are among the lucky ones whose vets have access to these, um, this is something that uh, we basically want to think about using here. So what kind of rates are we doing? We get estrus induction about 100%. Can't beat that. Ovulation rates of 80 and pregnancy rates of 60 to 70%. So I think both of the last two uh, options are something we definitely want to consider and we certainly want to rule out the use of gonadotropins as, as our choice. So what do we do? We use dopamine agonists here with buttercups. And basically as long as everything else that we ruled out, and we did rule those out or normal, then certainly can, we can go and induce estrus. So buttercup was treated with a dopamine agonist, and then... She was in season after 10 days. So after three years of not seeing any signs of heat and we ruled out any abnormalities, she's in season after 10 days. And the beauty of this is she got 10 puppies. So Buttercup's owners were happy. We as veterinarians are happy. And obviously we have 10 puppies on the ground that are healthy. So everybody's happy here. So always rule out some abnormalities before we want to go and induce estrus, but once we rule those out, estrus induction is certainly a possibility and, and certainly one we want to use today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Fontaine, and he's going to tell you about two cases of reproduction that uh, he was involved in, um, and so learn from him. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Kessler. And again, I really like the Buttercup case because it really shows what we can do today thanks to those fantastic protocols we, we have access to. But now let's move on to the, to the second case because now we're going to talk about another Labrador. We are going to talk about this one here, Ziggy. And before we get into Ziggy, Ziggy's clinical case, uh, we need to look at her history. And in fact, her story really started two years before the first time I, uh, I saw her in clinic. Because this bitch, in fact, she was bred when she was two. And you see, when she, she was seen at the vet clinic for a pregnancy diagnosis, look, this is what we could see under ultrasound. Uh, here you can clearly see that there are embryos. So obviously, when the owners were told that she was expecting at least six puppies, you can imagine that, well, they were super happy, right? Because when we breed dogs, 
That's what we expect. We, are, we want to have those puppies to improve our genetic selection program and to improve our genetics. And, well, here, she was bred, she was pregnant, fantastic. So the owners were really super happy, and they, could, they, they were really looking forward to having those puppies. So what they did is that they estimated Ziggy's due date. They, esti- they estimated it, and they, they were waiting for her to deliver, you know, those at least six beautiful Labrador puppies. But things didn't go as smoothly, obviously. Two days after the estimated due date, well, still nothing. Ziggy was acting normal. It really didn't look like she was about to give birth to her puppies, you know? And her owners, obviously, were a little bit worried. They decided to wait, you know? They said one day or two, and we'll go to the vet. That sounded like a reasonable approach for them at that time. But however, the evening before they were supposed to, to go to the clinic, something happened. Ziggy didn't show any sign she was about to give birth during the day. But now, in the evening, she was, they could clearly see this green discharge coming out of her vulva. And they knew, they knew that green discharge in a pregnant bitch means placental detachment. They knew that there was something wrong because, she, again, she had absolutely no clinical signs she was about to give birth. So obviously now, as you can imagine, they were freaking out. They were freaking out, and what they did, they did the right thing to do when something like that happened. They rushed to their vet clinic for an emergency consultation. So I'm going to skip you the details, but it ended in Ziggy having a C-section. She had a C-section, and the sad part is because it was an emergency C-section, and by the time they got there and they started to, to do the C-section, unfortunately, two puppies didn't make it. And you see, that's how Ziggy's breeding career started. It was a lot of stress for the owners. It was a lot of stress for the beach. And for the long time, they were really wondering if they should breed her again because they didn't want to go through this again. And you see, time passed. Almost two years, in fact, before I saw her in clinic. And when we saw her, she was in season. And the owners, they had this question. They, they were looking for an answer. Should they breed her one more time? Or should they rather avoid doing this? Because again, they went through a terrible experience the first time they bred Ziggy. So let me ask you guys, if you were in their shoes, if you were to take this decision, you have this very valuable breeding bitch from a genetic standpoint, but you had this bad experience in the past, what would you do? Tell us, what would you do here? Would you decide not to breed her again because you really don't want to experience that one more time? Would you decide to breed and see what happens? Would you decide to breed and immediately ask for a C-section? Or would you decide to breed and ask for an embryo transfer? What would you guys do here if you were in the shoes of Ziggy's owners? Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, and uh, most of you are going for let's breed and see what happens. So I, I'm always a, t- a little bit sad because in the three webinars we did, nobody picked breed and asked for embryo transfer. Well, I'm just kidding here because embryo transfer is not something that is available today in routine veterinary medicine for dog breeders, but who knows, in the future it might totally change the way we approach canine repro, but anyway, I'm digressing here. So one important fact I want to point out here, and I really believe it's important because this is something we are asked a lot about in the field, is that, you see, the fact that the bitch had a previous C-section does not always mean that she will require another C-section in the future. And that is, in my opinion, something really, really important to point out here because, again, we get this question a lot. Be aware that with the optimal surgical technique, the uterus will heal super fast. I mean, sometimes 15 days after we perform the dissection, we can't even see the stitches on the body of the uterus. And that's really quite amazing when you think of it. 
Technically speaking, after a beach had a C-section, there is no further increase in the risk of her having another C-section later in her life. And again, I'm mentioning that because I truly believe that's an important fact to keep in mind because, again, I'm very often asked the question in the field and uh, keep this in mind because it's not because she had one first C-section that she's going to have C-section or that is going to be always C-section. But, you know, here, in Ziggy's case, there's one thing that could totally change the discussion. If we had a better idea of why Ziggy, in fact, was not able to deliver her puppy in the first place, if we knew that, then we could may take a reasonable decision. We could say, okay, we, this is what we should do because we know what caused the issue in, in the first place. And there's one thing we need to keep in mind here, which in my opinion is very important, is the fact that Ziggy is a Labrador. And remember what we were saying at the very beginning, what I told you in the introduction. Labradors are often described as easy whelpers. They are described as an easy breed in canine repro. At least that's what we think of it when we are in vet clinics. Because there's, in the scientific literature, there's not much. Well, there's not much when it comes to Labrador and reproduction, but there's one thing which is kind of interesting when you look at parturition. And when you look in the scientific literature, when you look for Labradors and parturition, you might find this number, 20%. What is this 20%? So you see, there, there are some studies that were done on C-section in beaches, especially emergency C-section in beaches. And one of them was an epidemiological study that was trying to point out the risk factors or the, the, the most common factors on beaches we see uh, in an emergency clinic for C-section. And interestingly enough, 20% of those beaches that were seen for an emergency C-section were Labradors. 20%, that's a lot when we think of it. In the, canine, uh, in the canine species, we usually encounter around 15% of what we call dystocias, difficulties to give birth. So 20% Labradors presented for emergency C-section, that's really, really high when we think of it. And of course, some of you might say, oh, but the study might be biased because of the population they studied, etc. That's always a possibility. But still, the fact that they are mentioned as a breed where, in which C-section is not uncommon is really, really interesting because that's not something that is reported in many of the textbooks. And typically, that's not the breed you expect to see when it comes to C-section. And there's something else which is interesting. If you keep digging in, on, on parturition in Labrador, you might see this term, primary uterine inertia. Uh, that's something we see quite a lot. In fact, I've heard Lots of lab breeders talk to me about this. Primary uterine inertia means basically that the uterus doesn't contract or does not provide strong enough contractions at the time of parturition. That obviously leads to difficulties to give birth. That obviously leads to C-section. And potentially that will lead to an increased neonatal mortality rate because, again, this one can quickly skyrocket up to 40%. So tell me, guys, what can cause uterine inertia in Labradors? Is it bad luck? Is it a genetic predisposition? Is it overweight? Is it stress? Tell me, what could potentially cause uterine inertia, according to you, in Labradors? Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, great. And, and I like the way you guys answered because you know what? In fact, the, current, the correct answer here would be all of the above, except, I mean, obviously bad luck because there is no such thing as, you know, in dog breeding. <laughs> I mean, we're just dealing with the complexity of biology and we know that when we breed dogs, right? So in Labrador, something important to keep in mind is that today, there are some evidence that certain lines could be genetically predisposed to develop uterine inertia. Again, that's what I hear from you guys in the field. And in a recent paper from 
a guide dog breeding center, this is something that was clearly mentioned. So to quote the studies, basically it said that the weight of the bitches, as well as the maternal and paternal factors that could influence the weight of the puppies themselves, could be involved in the decision to perform a C-section in Labradors. So one recommendation that came out of this guide dog study was this one. Dams with an adult body weight substantially below average should not be selected as breeders in this colony. And I think that's a very important point. That's really something they emphasize. So you see in this study, below average meant below 25 kilograms. And again, they obviously insisted on the fact that this is something that might only be relevant to their own population of dogs because they were only working with certain lines there. But it did point out that the role genetics could play in a given breeding population here. So definitely something to keep in mind. And if you guys are interested in this study, be aware that this one is freely available for download online. So you can go online, find the study, download it and read it, and you, you'll have all the details. But that was something very interesting to keep in mind, in my opinion here. And at the very beginning, we talked about what everybody knows about Labradors, the fact that they are predisposed to overweight, the fact that they are basically walking food vacuum cleaners. I mean, the breed does have a clear predisposition here, and this is something that has been proven to, to, that they are genetically predisposed to. But this is not something that was pointed out by the guide dog study, but the reason might be quite simple, in fact, because in this colony, they, are trying to, they were trying to make sure that all their, dog, all their breeders were within more or less 1.5 kilogram around their adult target weight. So they were trying to make sure all those dogs were in optimal body condition, as Dr. Kessler mentioned at the beginning. So, and we know overweight and obesity can have an impact on the strength of uterine contra contraction. Maybe you guys remember this graph that I showed you in previous webinars. You see, when it comes to parturition, at the time of whelping, this is what a normal pattern of uterine contraction look like. But look, in individuals that are overweight, in individuals that are obese, you see less contractions. You see weaker contractions. So fat can infiltrate the uterine muscle and, fat, and therefore can impact the strength of the contraction, can decrease the strength of the uterine contractions. So you see, we already touched on the importance of optimal body condition score. It's important for fertility, but now you understand that it is also important when it comes to whelping. And obviously here, uh, we absolutely need to mention stress as well, because stress can inhibit uterine contraction. And this is something to always keep in mind when it comes to primiparous bitches, you know, those bitches that are giving birth for the first time. It was Ziggy's first litter, if you remember. So it could definitely, uh, definitely have played a role here as well. So very quickly, two quick words on stress and parturition. The current recommendations are, first, we recommend to isolate the bitch in a maternity at least a week before she gives birth because this one-week adaptation period will help her get more familiar with this new environment and can definitely help prevent the stress of parturition. On top of that, certain authors will also recommend to use pheromones you know, those appeasing, appeasing molecules in the maternity so that to, in order to appease the bitch at the time of whelping. So I'm sure you get the priority here. We want to make sure the bitch is in a stress-free environment at the time of parturition. No loud sounds, no, uh, not a noisy environment, not many animals around. You know your bitches. You know how, what will make them feel comfortable or not. But again, one thing you really need to focus on as well is the, uh, the environment they are giving birth in. You need to make it as stress-free as, as possible, and especially in primiparous bitches, this must be a top priority here. So you see, in this specific case, um, in, in Ziggy's case, the owners, they finally came to the clinic and they were, were telling us, you know what, we want to breed her. We definitely want to breed her. Uh, they were aware that they didn't know for sure what was, going, what was causing the issue, but they said, okay, let's breed her. So if you were to take this decision, what do you think would be the next best step here? 
Should we start by defining the right feeding plan? Should, we, should they learn how to better manage whelping? Should they focus on doing the timing of ovulation? Or should they focus on determining the number of puppies the bitch would be expecting? So tell me, again, this is a bitch that has a history of difficult birth. They went through a C-section, a very painful experience. Now they want to optimize everything they can to, to, to try to prevent this risk. What would be the best next step? The next best step. What do you think? What would be the thing to focus on here in your opinion? Five, four, three, two, one. Okie dokie. And um, interestingly enough, many of you mentioned, oh, they definitely need to work on the right feeding plan. And I truly agree. That's definitely something we want to focus on. But you know what? The correct answer here is, in fact, all of the above. In fact, all of those are things you will need to do, guys, if you ever deal with a case like Ziggy. And the number one thing I would recommend here, obviously, is to do a timing of ovulation. Because parturition 101, you need to have a clear idea of the day of parturition. When you know when the bitch is going to give birth, you're immediately more accurate. And in fact, we know that from ovulation to parturition, there, is, there are 63 more or less one day. So, and that's very accurate in Labrador. If you know when they ovulate, you know roughly more or less one day when they are going to give birth. And that's definitely a data you want to have here because that will make your life much easier. Step number two would be to clearly focus on the right feeding plan. And again, we know that the right feeding plan during gestation will help optimize embryonic and fetal growth because that is something that will impact neonatal survival rates. But at the same time, if you control this, if you have the right feeding plan, it will help you minimize the risk of overweight in a breed that, again, we know that is highly predisposed to it. And this is something that can be achieved in a two-step way. The first thing you want to do is to properly feed the bitch during gestation. The turning point during gestation in canines is 42 days. That's if there's one number you need to remember when it comes to gestation, it's this one. 42 days of gestation. This is when you need to increase the caloric density of the diet, and you need to increase it like that. Plus 10% energy intake per week after day 42 of gestation until parturition. This is, at 42 days, this is typically when the bitch is switched to what we call a growth diet, puppy diet, typically, because it is more energy dense and it will allow to provide the energy the bitch needs in a smaller volume, which is important because think of it, the uterus is growing, compressing the stomach, so that will limit the ability of those bitches to ingest the, the, the amount of energy they require for, to, to, to maintain, to, to, to sustain embryonic and fetal growth. Well, I know, we are talking about Labrador here, so we might wonder about that, but you see, you get what I, see. You, you get what I mean here. And the second thing you want to do is to clearly monitor the weight gain of those bitches during gestation. And again, we have recommendations here. We know that at the time of parturition, a bitch should be 115 to 125% of her optimal body weight right before whelping. So you know the optimal body, the body weight of your bitches. So basically knowing that and knowing those numbers I just shared with you, you can do the math and you can basically monitor if they stay on track during the gestation. If they go overboard, if they gain too much weight, you can try to course correct, but this is something you can monitor throughout gestation. And again, I really think that's an important thing to, to, for you guys to keep in mind in this breed. So if you like to do the math, very easy. If you don't like to do the math, you can reach out to people like Dr. Kessler and I because basically that's what we do on a regular basis. And over the years, we created Excel sheets that can help you, get, help you guys out here. So if you need them, feel free to reach out. We'll be more than happy to share them with you so you can properly monitor that because that's something you can very easily monitor in Labrador. And the step three would be to determine the litter size. Uh, 
there's something, you know, we call the single puppy syndrome. I'm sure you've heard about that. Large red bitches only expecting a single puppy. We know that those animals are the higher risk of dystocia. Again, difficulties to give birth. And the reasons are multiple. I mean, there are just multiple. There are just a couple of reasons. But a single puppy might be too big because it has lots of room to grow. Or maybe because there's just a single puppy, the signal the puppy sends to the mother at the time of parturition isn't, is simply not strong enough to induce parturition. So single puppy syndrome could be an issue and you want to make sure the bitch is not expecting a single puppy. But there's an important fact you guys need to know here. There are data, in fact, in Labrador showing that, in fact, when dealing with a singleton litter, 50% of the, those Labrador bitches will require a cisection. 50% singleton liters in Labradors require a cisection. This is a study that was presented a few years ago uh, at a seminar I attended. And I, that's very interesting because it, it means that when you have a singleton liter, one bitch out of two will require a cisection. So this is something you want to bring to the attention of your veterinarian, especially when this single puppy they are expecting comes from a very variable breeding. So again, important fact to have in mind when you breed Labradors. And step four is obviously to get ready for the parturition by decreasing the stress, having everything on hand. And you know, we could speak for hours about how to better manage parturition. I think I have a three hour seminar just on that. But you know what, we're not going to do that tonight. Again, don't you worry guys, we're going to try to keep this light and sweet. But one thing we did a couple, uh, I think a year ago, we did a webinar on how to better approach parturition in canine. So feel free to refer to this one. It's on YouTube. It's available to anybody who wants to take a look at it. And during this, we share with you some of the tips and tricks we learned over the years on how to optimize the, 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 the management of whelping in canine. So this is available. Feel free to reach out. And if you can't find it, just let us know. We'll share the link with you. There is, however, a way to be 100% sure of what to expect during Ziggy's parturition. And to do that, we would need to be able to monitor the uterine contraction, which can be done if we have access to something like that here. This is a tocodynamometer, the machine that is basically monitoring the strength of the uterine contractions. That's what they use in human medicine. And by the way, this, uh, this that is something that was used in the guide dog study I previously mentioned. That's how, in fact, they were able to point out that weak uterine contractions will predispose the bitch to C-section. And they could use this as a marker to make the right decision. You know, unfortunately, the problem is those machines are not yet easily available in veterinary clinics. That's, however, that being said, that's, however, something we look forward to because Clearly, this is the future of canine obstetrics, and that will make us much more accurate on what, on what needs to be done in a case like Ziggy. So you see here, in Ziggy's case, she was bred, and she got pregnant. Her owner did all the steps we just mentioned because, again, they really wanted to have everything under control. So she was pregnant. She had nine puppies, and she had nine puppies that were born without any assistance. So obviously here, everything ended up well. But keep in mind one thing, when you deal with those cases, there is always a part of uncertainty. And because of this part of uncertainty, the monitoring is paramount. Those four steps we just went through, those are critical. And those are things you can do in partnership with your veterinarians for some of them. But those are things you can do to optimize the condition. And again, try to prevent the problems as much as possible. And that's what we need to focus on. And as you can see, this is especially important in certain lines of Labrador because again, uterine inertia is a real thing that you guys need to keep in mind in this breed. And now let's move to our last case. Let's touch on the story of Lily. And you see this time, uh, as you can see right now, it is a, a Labrador newborn puppy story. Lily is four, and she, has, she was bred a couple of months ago. And you see, she, uh, she gave a, letter, a litter of seven newborn puppies just a few days before. And, I mean, according to her owner, Lily is a great mom, and she's producing tons of milk. 
And nothing surprising here because as you might have noticed, Labrador are usually quite good at this. The owners are not too concerned because Lily already had two liters and things always went pretty smoothly. All light seems green here. So, so far, I mean, the puppies, they look great. They look great. They are very active. And they are gaining weight. Neonatology 101. If there's one thing you need to add in your maternity, I keep repeating myself here, but you need a scale. If you don't have one, please order one right now on Amazon or go and buy one at the department store. But you definitely need one. Again, Neonatology 101. Newborn puppies, healthy puppies gain weight on a daily basis. So everything looks fine here. Everything except that the owner just noticed something. You see, it's something a bit weird, in fact. The newborn stools, they used to look like this. You see, they have this orangey color that is totally normal in newborn puppies. That's what we expect to see newborn puppies if we are fast enough, because, you know, especially in labradors, the mother will eat them, will swallow them pretty quickly. But that's what the owners were used to see. And suddenly, today, they realized that, well, the stools turned white. And that's pretty unusual. Pretty unusual. And they are really wondering what is going on here. So tell me, guys, what would you think? What do you think is happening? Why were, are those stools turning white? Is it because of a parvo infection? Is it because of a coccidia infection? Is it because of a toxic milk syndrome? Or is it because of an overconsumption? What do you think is happening here? So five, four, three, two, one, and that's great. You guys do know your Labrador 101 here. So very quickly, parvo infection is not something we expect to see in newborn puppies because parvo is typically a disease that we encounter at the time of weaning. So, and this is something we covered in many other webinars with, by, with Dr. Kessler. So I, 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 if you want to learn more, don't hesitate to watch those, but definitely not something we would expect here. Coccidia, well, there are cases of neonatal coccidia that have been described. However, to my knowledge and in my experience, those are really, really not uncommon. We look for them from time to time when we really don't suspect anything else. But the main two reasons newborn puppies will develop this white stool color is because of a toxic milk syndrome or an overconsumption. Because, in fact, the, the one thing I can say for sure when I see stools turning white in newborn puppies, is that they are no more able to digest the milk properly. This is a typical clinical sign, in fact, of maldigestion issues in newborn. It usually starts like this, and then it eventually turns into a diarrhea. Neonatal diarrhea, as I'm sure you're aware, is never a good thing on individuals that are basically made of nearly 82% water. So when stools start to turn white in newborns, we know that something is wrong. And in newborns, as you guys pointed out, there are mainly two potential causes here. Bacterial infection. When dealing with newborn and when dealing with neonatal diarrhea and change in color in the stools, that's always something you want to keep in the corner of your mind. That because those bacterial infections are very common in newborn puppies. And there are three words you need to remember when it comes to bacterial infection in newborn puppies. The first one is here, E. coli. E. coli is the number one infectious cause of neonatal mortality in newborn puppies. It's the number one bacterial pathogen that we cause issue in newborn puppies. Second word you need to know is mastitis, because basically those bacteria can, can potentially have only two origins. They can come from, from the milk and basically this is related to a mastitis and inflammation of the mammary gland. In canines, there are only bacterial mastitis have been described so far. Or they can come from the environment. Again, the environment can be a source of bacteria. And 
that's why when those new bomb puppies are born, uh, are born, <laughs> are born, sorry about that, <laughs> when those new, new bomb puppies are born, there are two things we want to do immediately. We want to properly disinfect the, umbilical, the, the terminal end of the umbilical cord two, three times a day until it falls down. We want to make sure the nest stays as clean as possible. And again, it, uh, this last part comes back to cleaning and disinfecting. We have, again, tons of videos and blog posts on that topic. Those are really two things you need to consider here. So there's a potential bacterial infection in a case like that. So first thing you want to do, because you know that it can come from the mammary glands of the bitch, is to check our mammary glands. You want to check if there's no mastitis developing. And what you would expect to see are red, swollen, painful mammary glands. That's what we would expect when we're dealing with a clinical mastitis. In Lily's case, that's the first thing we checked. And you know what? There was nothing, nothing to be seen, no clinical symptoms. When we were palpating the mammary glands, the tissue looked totally normal. The milk, the color of the milk was totally normal as well. It wasn't red, it wasn't brown, it was milk, it was white, as we were expecting it to be. So in a case like that, we might think, hey, you know what, maybe we can rule out mastitis. Maybe it isn't a mastitis, but there's one thing I need to point out here. Remember that in canines, subclinical mastitis is a thing. We touched on it in a webinar a couple of years ago. This is a disease that is not well understood yet in, in bitches. I mean, we don't have clear, it's not easy to diagnose in practice. We don't have all the tools in veterinary clinics. We are not, there's no consensus on what's the best therapeutic approach on the bitches that are suffering from this disease. But my point here is, it is a thing. So it's not because you don't see any clinical signs on the mammary gland of the bitch that it means that there's nothing. There's always a potential risk for subclinical mastitis. And that's something I want you guys to keep in mind here. And the other thing you obviously need to keep in mind, but I see that you guys know about that, is the overconsumption thing. We're dealing with Labradors here. Remember what we said at the beginning, voracious appetite. I can tell you one thing. This starts right from the beginning, as soon as they are born. They have a tendency to overeat, overdrink, not really sure what's the best term to use here, but they will overconsume milk. And when they do that, when they do that in humans, when those newborns are doing that, it will overload their digestive capacities. It will lead to something we call osmotic diarrhea. So they might develop diarrhea simply because they eat too much and they don't have the enzymatic equipment to properly digest it. Always something to keep in mind here. So you see, we have two potential causes we always need to mention, especially in Labrador puppies. So knowing that, what should we do? What should we do here? Nothing. We should start giving antibiotics. We should go for a milk replacer, or we should go for a milk replacer plus antibiotics. What would you do in a case like that? Again, puppies have white stools, and we know that there are two potential causes, bacterial infection and overconsumption. What would you go for here? So five, four, three, two, one, and we don't really have a consensus here apparently, but you know what? It's okay because you see in the past, when we were dealing with those cases, we, we tended to, to go first for antibiotics because we really wanted to, to, to fight the potential bacterial infection, even if we were not really sure if this is what was happening. Today, we know better. We know that antibiotic treatment in newborns can potentially severely disturb the microbiome, the digestive microbiome, those bacteria that we find in the guts of those newborns. And this disturbance can have terrible consequences in, in the future for those animals. We have evidence in humans that when kids are receiving too much antibiotics while growing up, well, their immune system will be weaker when they become adults. 
And that's something we do suspect as well in canines. We still have lots of things, tons of things to learn about the canine microbiome, but we do know one thing, it does play a role in the immune system maturation. And that's why we want to avoid giving antibiotics as much as possible, especially in newborns. So that's why you see more and more in those cases like that, especially on top of that, because it's Labradors we're dealing with here. The first thing I would recommend is to go for a milk replacer, is to switch them to a milk replacer. Because the first thing I would suspect here would always be an overconsumption, especially, remember in this case, the puppies are doing great. They, are, they don't have any other clinical signs. They are not losing weight yet. So because of that, we will suspect first an overconsumption. And first thing, we we'll switch them to a milk replacer. And when we use a milk replacer, there are a few things we need to keep in mind. First, we want to use a canine milk replacer. I insist on that. It seems trivial. But again, I spend a lot of time on Facebook forums. I get a lot of emails. And very often people will tell me that, well, they use goat milk when they want to bottle feed their puppies. And today we know better. We know that. The canine milk is more energy dense than goat's milk. We know that uh, the goat's milk has a higher osmolality, which means that uh, it has a higher, it can increase the risk of neonatal diarrhea in puppies because it contains more lactose. So we know for sure that there's nothing better than something that is really close, as close as possible to the beef's milk. And I know I've met some of you might tell me, yeah, we've been using goat's milk for 15 years and we never had any issue. Maybe, but uh, on the other hand, I have tons of people who also tell me they use goat milk swan and they have neonatal diarrhea in their puppies. So my point here is we know better than that today. And if we, the best thing we can provide those newborn puppies with is definitely a, canine, a dedicated canine milk replacer. But it's not only about the product you're going to use. It's also about your use, or the way you're using it. And one important thing that I really uh, want to emphasize is that you need to use it at a proper dilution. Keep in mind that in newborn puppies and also in, baby, in human babies, one of the most common mistakes we see when using milk replacer is that those milk replacers are not properly diluted, which means that they are higher risk of constipation, diarrhea, just because the milk is over or under concentrated. So really make sure you're sticking to the recommendations when it comes to preparing actually the milk replacer because it can make a big difference here. And because again, we're suspecting overconsumption here, the great thing I like when using a milk replacer here is that you can easily control the quantities those puppies are drinking. You can monitor them. So therefore, you know they're getting exactly what they need. And that's important because in those newborn Labradors, I can tell you one thing, some of them, they will drink one bottle and they will look at you even if their eyes are still closed because, well, they're still young, but they will look at you asking for another bottle. So you need to be able to monitor those quantities. And you have the feeding guidelines to help you out here. If you want to be more accurate, you can do some math. And again, that's something we do on a regular basis and you can reach out to us to, for help here but you need to be able to make sure they're receiving an alchemic. They're not over-drinking, over-eating, call it however you like. And on top of that, whatever you do in those newborns, you always want to keep monitoring their weight gain. Remember, a healthy puppy gains weight on a daily basis. You have your scale. You still need to weight them on a daily basis to make sure they're not doing a plateau or they're not losing weight. That's, I'm repeating myself. I'm always saying that, but again, guys, that's, something very simple that can help you win big here. And in a case like that, I will always be, uh, fo be focusing on the first 24 hour period after we switch them to a milk replacer. Because you want to see clinical improvement, which means basically here, stools returning to their normal color in the next 24 hours. If it is not the case, or if they start doing a plateau or losing weight, you know that you need to go to your veterinarian because there will be some, you will need this adjunct, ad, adjuvant treatment that uh, we didn't start with here. So clearly the 24 hour period is critical. And you see in the case of buttercup, oh buttercup, sorry, of Lily, uh, 24 hour after giving them the milk replacer, uh, well, the stools were back to normal. 
it didn't get worse because I believe that the problem was detected as soon as it appeared. And we took the right measures right from the beginning so that we'll, that, that definitely helped, in my opinion, prevent any casualty. And I'm mentioning this because, again, this type of neonatal diarrhea is very frequent in Labrador. And I mean, during the entire afternoon, all of you guys answered first overconsumption. So you guys know that when you breed Labrador. This is very common. And definitely something, if you were not aware of, you need to be aware of it because that's really common when we're breeding Labradors. And as you can see, there are things we can do to, to, to better support those newborns. So you see, tonight we covered three clinical cases discussing reproductive challenges you can and you might encounter in, in Labrador retrievers. Buttercup, Lily, Ziggy, you see those were considered reproductive challenges. And very often in the field, when I hear from people that are facing cases like that, you know, very often they will tell me, oh, but doc, nothing could be done. Nothing can be done. You have heard and seen today that, in fact, that's not always true. In those three cases, at least, well, those challenges, we were able to overcome them. Those are cases I believe you need to be prepared for. As we said earlier, several times, and I will, as we will keep saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, that's what dog breeding is all about. So you can only prevent those things if you know about them. And what I hope is that at least tonight, you've heard a bit about those cases. Now you're better prepared on what to do if you ever were to deal with something like this. And that will make your life eventually much easier, I hope, when you have a better understanding and a better idea of how to approach those cases. And this is it. We just reached the end of our webinar. So again, thanks again so much, guys, for taking the time to join us in this virtual conference room of ours and actively participate in the discussion. This is something Dr. Kessler and I greatly appreciate, and we are really grateful that we have the opportunity to spend those moments, even if it's online, it's always great to discuss and to share with people that are as passionate as we are. So, and you see, we always say the webinar ends here, but the discussion continues. In a moment, we will do a quick Q&A. So if you have questions, start posting them right now on the chat. And, but my point here is, if you have questions on similar or different cases in the coming days, in the coming weeks, in the coming months, feel free to reach out to us. Again, we'll be happy to help if we can. And you know, every time you ask a question, we learn. And this is thanks to the questions we receive from you guys that we are able to create those kind of webinars that are based on our experience in real life. So keep sending us your questions and we'll, try to, we'll keep trying to answer them. And you know what? We'll use those answers to help as many breeders as possible. So thank you again, every, thanks again, everyone. It was a pleasure. I wish you guys a great evening, a good morning for those of you who are on the other side of the planet. I've seen we had people from Japan and Italy, but, uh, and Italy and Australia. Sorry about that. But thank you very much. And I hope to, to see you guys very soon. Maybe in real life, that would be great. But whatever happens, you know what? We'll see each other online. Have a great evening, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>